الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله Please indulge me for a moment When you see, imagine yourself sitting in a plane, a train, or a bus And you see someone dressed like myself come in, sit beside you, and utter these phrases What goes through your mind? Are you uncomfortable? Are you scared? Are you expecting kaboom? Are you expecting someone like this? Why is it that we expect someone, some of you expect someone like that and not someone like this? The average Muslim of the 1.6 billion Muslim, 99% use those expressions and those symbols differently from the terrorist. Why does that happen? Because extremists have hijacked our symbols and our terms. Don't worry, this just has my leftover lunch and my class notes. And don't get excited, I have clothes underneath this. So it's not a strip show or anything like that. So vast majority of Muslims around the world use these expressions and these symbols in a positive way. I dress like that sometimes when I go to special occasions, the mosque. In fact, I have photographs in, that, in this outfit. But my wife is afraid of me posting them on Facebook because Islamophobes always attack me for the work I do, and she fears that they may, take, they, they may take this and scare people with it. And I only posted it recently for this event. How can we solve this problem? So if you bear with me, we'll get to that in a minute. But first, a story. One of my friends, Hafsa, shared a story this past Halloween where she was getting ready to give out candies to kids. A cute kid dressed up as a dinosaur shows up. And, you know, as she's reaching in for the candy, the innocent child reaches and whispers, are you dressed like a terrorist for Halloween? Because she was in hijab. Innocent child. My friend said she wasn't offended with the child. She simply smiled, gave the kid more candy, and just felt bad and sorry that Kids like this will grow up thinking that something, somebody different is scary. Again, why does that happen? Because our symbols and expressions have been hijacked by extremists. A practicing Muslim will say these words hundreds of times a day. Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Masha Allah. Non-practicing Muslims say these words. Arab Christians say these words. In fact, some of you may say these words, God willing, God bless you. My daughter, three-year-old, comes back from daycare sometimes and says, when she hears somebody sneezing, God bless you. And then she looks at me and she says, Alhamdulillah. Same thing. She knows. But people are scared. A Muslim is told to start everything with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Yet, these terms of mercy and compassion have become terms of hate. How can we solve that? I, I had a child this past summer, and the first words we're instructed to recite into the ears of the baby is, God is great. I did that. Not party to a cult of death as terrorists, but to show the sacredness of life and that it comes from God Almighty. So these symbols have all been hijacked, but other groups have also extremists in them, in their groups who have hijacked their religious ideas. Yet when you think of Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, etc. You don't think of the people like this. As I speak today, they're Buddhist extremists killing Muslims in Myanmar, Burma. But we don't think of that. 
We don't think of Hindu extremists who are doing violence in India. We don't think of Christian extremists. We don't think of other extremists. We only think of positive. Yet when it comes to Muslims, we only think of, or many of us think of the negative, fear. Again, it's because our symbols have been taken over by extremists. And in fact, these extremists who are a very minimal number in our community have done so much damage and the damage they do is that 95% of the victims of these terrorists are actually Muslims. Yet their interpretations, their use of these terminologies is applied to everyone. I don't usually quote President Trump approvingly, but he himself said 95% of the victims of terrorists are Muslims. Yet their way is applied to all Muslims. Why, why does this happen? Why is this entrenched? Well, people will say the media. Yes, the media reports the narrative that terrorists do. So terrorists say this is done in the name of religion. Media reports it, it reinforces. But very few of us can actually do something about the media directly. The second reason for this is everyone sticks to their group. White people stick with white people, black people with black people, Muslims with Muslims, Christians with Muslims. There's not as much engagement and interaction. Conversations are not taking place. So a recent study, three quarters of white Americans do not have non-white friends. Not picking on just white people, that's probably true with other cultures and groups as well. If that's the case, then we have no conversations taking place. We have no dialogue taking place. Third reason is the extremists among every group, every group has extremists and fanatics. They are now talking to each other. We have extremists in the Muslim community speaking with extremists in non-Muslim communities, be it religious or secular. They're dialoguing. The rest of us are busy living our lives and the extremists are talking to themselves. We are not conversing. The conversation must be between us, but it's between extremists. It's a clash of extremisms, not a clash of civilizations. Again, how do we deal, begin to deal with this? The theme, conversations. A line of research that's taken place, been taking place for a long time, since so the 1950s, Gordon Allport started talking about this theory called contact hypothesis. The idea is you get people to converse, to engage, to talk. Initially, not to bore you with the details, initially there were lots of conditions and criteria that were required for these conversations to be, become fruitful. But later on, more recently, University of California psychologist Thomas Pettigrew and Linda Trope from the University of Massachusetts analyzed 500 of these studies and comes to the conclusion that yes, conversations with certain conditions and criteria can help remove bias, fear, and suspicion. But even without all of those criteria and all of those conditions, just mere communication, mere contact can help things, can improve things for all of us. So that's what we need to do. We need to converse. We need to engage. We need the average Joe speaking with the average Mo, not the extremists talking to each other. We need also Muslims when they do something positive, they, when they do something positive, they connect it to the religion. Because why? Extremists connect their negative stuff with the religion. And then the media reports it. But the positive that Muslims do is not connected to religion because Muslims are just like other people. We don't go around wearing our religion on the sleeve. But this dialogue has to take place where now Muslims say, well, I do this positive because my religion teaches me. Islam teaches. The Prophet Muhammad taught that we have three degrees of piety or Islamic awareness. Think of karate. You have seven belts from the white belt to the black belt. Think of this as three belts, the white belt, the brown belt, and the black belt. The white belt is a Muslim, one who submits to the will of God, 
And if somebody does something harmful to them, you take justice. The Prophet said, it's better for you to be a brown belt, a mu'min. A mu'min is someone who's, when a wrong is done to you, you forgive them. And then the Prophet said, it's even better if you become a black belt, a muhsin. When somebody does something wrong to you, you forgive them and you do something positive. And there's numerous instances in the life of the Prophet. One simple example I'll give you. The Prophet used to wake up in the morning, Prophet Muhammad used to wake up in the morning and his neighbor would put garbage in his path every day. And he would clear the garbage and he'd go on his way. One day he came out and there was no garbage. So the Prophet asked the companions, hey, what happened to the lady? Why there's no garbage? He said, oh, she's sick. So the Prophet went to visit the lady and wished her a good recovery. A quick recovery wished her well. The person was shocked. A conversation took place. Her perception of the Prophet changed and things changed from there. He was being a black belt, a muhsin. A Muslim is taught to be a muhsin. That's the peak of faith, the ideal of faith. So why is it when we think of Islam, when we hear Muslims, not too many think of that positive image of Islam? Because in theory, it's there. And in practice, it's there from the life of the Prophet, but also from these people. These people were living Islam. They were being muhsin. So the first we have Rukayya, a mother of a son who is murdered by a 14 year old for $60. She sees him in court and rather than taking revenge or saying, I hate you, she says, I want to help you. You were a child. I want to help you get out of this. I forgive you and I do not hate you because my way is not the way of hate. It's the way of Rahma, mercy. Remember when I said Bismillahir Rahman Rahim in the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. God is merciful. You have to be merciful if you want to seek the mercy of God. So she says, this is not my way. How come she doesn't come to the mind of most of us? Or the Arkansas mosque which paid, which again, being a black belt, a muhsin, paid the $1,700 fine of the vandal who did a hate crime against the mosque and he couldn't afford the $1,700 and he was gonna go to jail. The Muslim community came together, paid his $1,700, forgave and did something positive. Or what about Abdul Jitmud? The father forgives the murderer of the son hugs him and says, you know, when you come out of jail, do righteous deeds. Forgiveness is from God. Why is it that these things don't come into our picture? Well, because of the media, because of we don't know Muslims. We don't interact with Muslims. Most people don't interact with people. Most people don't converse. I'll, I'll end with a story. I've been living in Valparaiso for a long time. I was in a neighborhood and I didn't get to know my neighbors in that area because I was constantly traveling back and forth to Canada, Toronto. So the free time I have here, I'm running back to Toronto. Uh, otherwise I'd be at work here. But I did say hi and bye to one of my neighbors. Say hi, bye. You know, we were not rude to each other, but nothing beyond that. One day I parked my car across the street from his driveway. And my car, the one I had at the time was a low sports car, gray. And in the dark, the visibility is low. And he, my neighbor drives a big vehicle. So he probably didn't see it. And he backed into it, smashed the car. Significant damage. I wasn't there, but he left a note. Said, hey, I hit your car. My apologies. Please get some estimates and I'll take care of it. The next time I saw him, he came out, hey, what happened? I said, oh, don't worry about it. He said, what, huh? I was feeling bad because I parked it. I felt partly responsible, although he should still not have hit me. I felt partly responsible. My religion teaches me about justice. And I told him, Prophet Muhammad taught me to treat my neighbor very highly. There's lots of rights that your neighbor has over you. Whether they're Muslim, non-Muslim is irrelevant. For the neighbor, they have rights over you. 
And one day the prophet was sitting and teaching the companions about the rights your neighbor has over you. And he kept going down the list. They have this right, they have this right, they have this right. And one of the companions said, stop him. Because next he's going to say that your neighbor inherits from you. They were scared. We don't want that. So I told them, look, this is, you're like my family. It's okay. I'm, I feel partly responsible. Don't worry about it. Since then, that conversation developed a bigger conversation. They knew I was different. I was like, oh, this guy's Muslim, very decent, positive. Oh, and he taught me something about Islam. From that conversation, somehow I end up getting invited to the church they're part of. I get to have conversation with over 100 people about Islam. Not just theory, because they had already gone, they already part of this church, and they had probably told them, hey, this is the interaction I had. You told me about Islam. I think you need to hear. So I went and talked to the church. From the one conversation, conversation with 100 others. Then another church, from hearing somebody hearing that talk, another church invites me to a conversation. Then from that church, a group of elders who are doing a studies at the Valparaiso University, they asked me to talk about Islam. The conversation, one simple exchange, resulted in me being able to connect and tell about my practice of Islam, the practice that the vast majority of Muslims have, not the terrorist practice. This is what we need to do. We need to have conversations so you see that different is not scary. We're not similar in everything, but we have basics. The basic goals are the same. And this is not a kumbaya moment that everything is okay and everything's gonna be fine and dandy. No, there are haters. There are racists in every community. We're probably not gonna connect with them, but we will connect with the vast majority of people of goodwill that are trying to make this world a better place for everyone. So hopefully we will engage. One of my given names is Muhammad. So I'm a Mo. So maybe today, even if you're not a Joe, we could have a conversation between Joe and Mo and take it from there. So I hope that we go from here and we have conversations and those conversations help us understand each other and appreciate each other. Thank you very much for listening to me.